All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the MDTC Insurance Committee, I'd like to thank you all for joining our webinar today presented by Dr. Kelly Bosch of Rimkiss Consulting Group. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone uh, that we do have an upcoming event, March 16th, 2023, uh, for the Legal Excellence Awards. Uh, this is an in-person event at the GEM Theater. Uh, I personally attend it just about every year. It's a good opportunity to mingle, have some drinks, uh, have a nice strolling dinner, and uh, meet with the judiciary and all of our colleagues. I can't recommend the event enough. Um, I'd also like to thank our loyal sponsors. Uh, first and foremost, LCS Record Retrieval. Uh, secondly, Kitch Attorneys and Counselors. And I'd also like to thank Rimkus Consulting Group for putting, the, putting on this webinar today. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kelly Bosch uh, of Rimkus Consulting Group. Dr. Bosch uh, holds a BS degree in mechanical engineering, a master's in automotive engineering, and a PhD in biomecha biomechanical engineering. Uh, she also uh, has a certificate uh, or certified uh, vehicle accident reconstructionist, uh, and her areas of expertise include biomechanics of human injury, accident reconstruction, vehicle safety design, and military underbody blast occupant safety. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, uh, please feel free to submit them in the chat uh, portion there, and Dr. Bosch will be able to address those. Uh, and with that, uh, take it away. All right, can everyone hear me and see my screen okay? Hopefully. All right. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to share with you um, uh, some information about uh, brain injuries. So uh, you kind of already got my introduction. I recently, 2019, finished my PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, I spent a few years in industry in between my master's and my PhD. Um, so that kind of encouraged me to go back and learn a little bit more about the biomechanical um, engineering field. So my main focus is impact biomechanics. So the forces, accelerations, and loads that go into the body. Um, I do a lot with accident reconstruction. A lot of my work history is for different um, OEMs, uh, especially things like uh, vehicle design, safety, airbags, restraints, things like that. And I also spend some time in occupant safety for the military, including designing uh, a crash test dummy for underbody blast. So today I'll take you through uh, first, what is injury biomechanics? We'll go through the anatomy of the human body so you can get familiar with the brain and the head so we understand what we're talking about today. We'll explain, I'll explain the biomechanical approach that we take uh, for what we do here at Rimkus. And then I'll give you some case studies. Those are always really helpful to understand what is it that we can do for you? What are the types of things that we're very familiar with doing here? So to start, let's talk about what is biomedical engineering. This is the application of principles of engineering to problems in medicine and biology. So it's taking the things that we learn in, in general engineering and how does that apply to the human body itself? Uh, our education for this usually is general uh, traditional engineering disciplines, and then you get the focus of biology, physiology, and anatomy. Personally, I took the mechanical engineer route first, and then I added in all of the biology knowledge on top of that. And within the umbrella of biomechanical or biomedical engineering, you have biomechanical engineering. And that's, or that's really what I focus on is biomechanics and the study of mechanics of a living body, especially the forces exerted by the muscles, things like gravity, forces, accelerations on the musculoskeletal structure. So how do forces affect the human body? What are our uh, tissue tolerances against fracture or injury? Things like that. That's where we focus on biomechanics. Within biomedical engineering, you also have things like prosthetics um, and any medical device that you see is uh, controlled by biomedical engineering. So within the whole mechanical and uh, general engineering, we have mechanical testing. This is something that doesn't involve the human, but it's still really important to us. Uh, this is crash testing. And then in the background, you have airbag deployments. I'm not sure if you guys have the volume on that. Um, that in the background was driver airbags deploying. Um, as you can see, they're very high powered. There's a lot of research and testing that goes into making sure that airbags like that are safe for humans. Um, there's a lot of testing, a lot of development that goes into airbag deployments, making sure that it works with the restraint system in, in the US even without. So um, within our umbrella of research, we do a lot with mechanical testing. And then you start to get down into biomechanical testing. So that's where you introduce the human body. 
Um, this, this test here is uh, human volunteer testing. In the seat, the passenger seat, you see a uh, crash test dummy or an anthropomorphic test device, also known as an ATD. Um, the ATD is equipped with a lot of instrumentation. You've got accelerometers to tell us the acceleration in the head. We've got load cells in the neck, upper neck and lower neck to tell us forces and moments. We've got acceler accelerometers in the chest, uh, in the pelvis. We've got um, load cells in the lumbar spine. So a lot of instrumentation there to tell us what's going on. And there's always the question of how biofidelic is a crash test dummy compared to a human? So at low speeds, we have the opportunity to put humans in cars to see and next to an AT to, to see how close in behavior they are. Uh, that allows us to get information from an ATD that we can't get from a human, but also understand the kinetics and kinematics of occupant motion. So this is a rear impact. You'll notice that both the occupants go backwards. So a lot of people think in a rear impact, you go forward. Actually, you go back towards where the force is coming from. So I'll play it again. You'll see they both move backwards into the head restraint with a small rebound forward. Um, so these are the things that we look at when it comes to biomechanics is, you know, how does the human body move in, rel in relation to its surroundings? What are the forces that the body goes through? And then how does that affect the tissue level to understand what kind of injuries we may have? And then the field of biomechanics is actually even wider than this. Um, this is an example of the military looking at different um, body armor and things for, uh, for military use. So biomechanics is very wide reaching. We don't always see it, but it's always in the background. So it's, you know, how can we help the soldiers? How can we improve walking? How can we improve, you know, things like prosthetics? Biomechanics is, is quite far reaching with that. And we also have the application of biomechanics in things like sports, uh, understanding how does the human body move during something like a jump shot? What muscles are activated? How do they work together to make the body move? What kind of forces are involved within the body? And then sometimes how does that create injury? Um, and then the example here on the right is helmet to helmet contact, which comes into play in, in our discussion today um, in terms of traumatic brain injury with concussions. There's a lot of testing that's gone on to figure out how to design helmets to be safe, and then what kind of accelerations are experienced by the head during an impact. So it's really important to understand the difference between uh, biomechanics and medicine. So from the biomechanics side, we look at mechanisms. We don't look at symptoms. We are not an MD. We don't tell people what their diagnoses are. And we do not argue with those diagnoses. We take them at face value. Um, so our job is to understand how to connect the event to the injury via the mechanisms. So we look at what is the mechanism of injury. There's a lot of literature that we can look at. There's a lot of modeling techniques that we can use to understand uh, what happens during an event, what mechanisms is the body going through, and then we can assess whether or not the injuries that have been diagnosed are consistent with the event that occurred. So from our standpoint, we steer clear of the diagnosis, the treatment, and the prognosis. We will not sit and argue with a physician, um, but we will put our, our um, information together about the mechanisms and whether or not they were present to cause the injuries that are, have occurred. So taking you back to high school biology, a little bit on skull anatomy. So the big bone in the front is the frontal bone. On either side of your head, you have parietal bones. So that's the side, you've got the left and the right. In the back of the skull, you have the occipital bone. The bone that's right around your ears is the temporal bone. Um, many people are familiar with TMJ syndrome. That's the temporal mandibular joint. The mandible is the bottom part of your jaw where it connects to the temporal bone is that TMJ joint. That's where your, your jaw actually articulates on, on your skull. The zygomatic bone forms the bottom of your orbital um, opening. So where your eye is, so the, the arch underneath your eye. Maxilla is the top part of your mouth. And of course the nasal bones right in the front of your nose. So underneath your skull, there's several layers that protect the brain. It's membrane layers that are between the brain and the skull, and their job is to protect the brain. So the outside layer that's closest to the skull bone is called the dura mater. It's very leathery. It's very tough. The next layer underneath that is called the arachnoid mater. 
And then the final layer that's closest to the brain is called the pia. Um, these are, they're in the brain there to protect. They have the different layers, blood flow between them. Um, and then different injuries can occur between the different layers. When it comes to looking at head and brain injuries, there's a few things that we definitely want to concentrate on. One is, did a skull fracture occur? We understand that obviously skull fracture usually means a, a pretty traumatic event. Uh, the bleeds in the brain, I'll go into where those can be within the brain and kind of what they mean to us. Um, sometimes we have a brain contusion that's more serious, that's a bruising of the brain. And then there's the concussion, which is definitely one of the hot topics. Um, there's generally no structural damage with a concussion, but there is some temporary loss of function. There's been a lot of research over the years into the impact tolerance of the bones in the face. Um, so each one of these is showing you a different bone and a different force tolerance. Uh, so you can see the frontal bone up here. There's, you'll notice a very wide range from 1,000 to almost 6,500 newtons of force. So it's important to note that, <coughs> excuse me, every body is different. Um, a lot of times when these tests are performed, it's on cadavers that are older. Um, generally, there's everyone kind of knows that lifespan, you know, more people die at the end of life, more people that donate their bodies to science are older. So your sample set for cadaver testing is usually older. Um, sometimes we see reduced bone strength. There's the difference between men and women. So there's usually known bone strength differences between men and women. Uh, there's also how the testing was performed. Was it from a small square impactor versus a large circular impact or things like that. So we end up seeing a pretty wide range in literature, but it does give us a starting point to understand that if there is a skull fracture, um, this is kind of the general accepted range of where we would see the forces involved to cause a fracture. You'll notice that each zone has a, has a different range. So your nasal bone, I'm sure many of you can attest to, that is not a strong bone. So you're, it takes a lot less force to break your nasal bone. Um, you know, at zygomatic arch up to 2,500 newtons. So each area has its own range um, within the skull. And then of course the side and the back that's not shown here, but those have yet different ranges of, of strength. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's also pressure tolerance. So that's uh, just a different measure of uh, re um, ability to withstand uh, fracture. So now we'll start to get into the bleeding in the brain. So you, when you have bleeding above or below the dura matter, um, when it's above the dura, so the dura is this really thin uh, section right here that's that leathery uh, membrane, you have something called an epidural hematoma, hematoma. So that's bleeding between the skull and the dura. That's generally typical of impact injuries. Um, and then when you start to have the bleeding below the dura, that's called a subdural hematoma. Then the next layer down is the arachnoid. Um, when we see bleeding under the arachnoid, we call that a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This generally occurs with acceleration injuries. Uh, so that's motion of the, of the skull. Um, and we also, co also can see intracranial bleeds with acceleration injuries. So that's bleeding inside uh, deeper in the brain. This is something that's also seen with shaken baby syndrome as well. One of the phenomenons that we talk about is coup or contra coup. So this is a, a pretty interesting phenomenon where when you have a direct impact to the skull, you may see a brain injury that's not exactly where the brain or the skull was hit. Sometimes it shows up on the same side, the same place. So example, this first image here, A, this person fell on their forehead and you see the black represents the bleeding. So you actually see that's called a coup injury. Uh, the bleeding occurs where the injury occurred. But then you have a phenomenon where sometimes where you hit is not where the, the brain is actually damaged or bleeding. So in this case, the person fell on the back of their head, yet the bleeding presents in the front. So the brain is not perfectly held within the skull. It, it floats around in there in that uh, CSF. And the inside of the skull is not perfectly smooth. There's a lot of rough edges and bumps and things like that. So when someone falls or gets hit, the brain does move within the skull and there's lots of opportunities for injury to occur within the skull because of that movement. That, this phenomenon, phenomenon of coup and contra coup can happen on the side. So you get hit on one side and the bleeding presents on the other. 
And we've also seen it where the bleeding is in the middle of the brain, even though you hit on the outside. So it's, it's a, a phenomenon that you want to look for to try and explain, well, if, you know, say they were in a car accident and they got hit on one side of the head, but the bleeding's on the other, that doesn't necessarily mean they hit something on the other side of the car. It's the coup and contra coup effect. And if I'll, I'm trying to watch the chat, so if anyone has questions, by all means, please let me know and I'll try and address them as we go. So there's a lot of theories of closed head injury um, because you can't really do uh, brain injury testing on cadavers because they're not alive anymore. It's a little harder to get as, as much information as we can about how brain injuries occur. So when it comes to closed head injury, we know that the brain can physically strike the interior surface of the skull. As I explained it, it's, uh, it's not smooth in there and the brain does move. There's also theories that there's pressure wave upon impact. There's research that shows, for example, if you hit the back of the head, there is a pressure wave that goes through the brain um, from that impact. There is a mechanism called shear. Shear is when two surfaces move against each other. Um, there's gray and white matter within your brain and they have different mechanical properties. So as they move relative to each other, it can actually cause, cause shear or tearing within the brain because those two materials don't move the same way. Uh, there's a lot of information and, and research about rotation of the brain and the skull and how that causes injury um, as the brain moves around, or essentially around the CG of your head. And then there's also micro deformation of the brain. So it's definitely an, an interesting topic with a lot of research and a lot of different theories um, about what exactly is it that's causing brain injury. Now moving into concussion, which we also call mild TBI or sometimes you see it MTBI. There's a lot of claims of MTBI that are being caused by minor events and we're seeing a lot more of those claims uh, recently. There's a couple theories about why we're seeing more claims. One is that there's greater awareness. I think everyone has kind of heard over the years about we're starting, you know, the NFL, they're doing more um, analysis on concussions. Kids sports, you know, we're doing the timeout, we're doing the concussion checks, the kids are sitting out longer. So we're definitely as a society more aware of concussion as an issue and the fact that repeated concussions can cause long-term effects. There's also a greater suspicion for TBI. So everyone's kind of looking for these things. You know, if someone gets hit on the head, everyone's really focused on, okay, we need to assess if there's a TBI. We have a lot better recognition. We know what the signs are. We know looking for loss of consciousness, things like confusion. Um, as, as a society, we're, we're more in tune with how to recognize the signs of a concussion so we can actually do something about it. But the challenge here is that it doesn't show up in objective testing. So when you do scans like MRIs or CTs, there's no way to diagnose a concussion from that. So you're almost relying on the person to explain their symptoms to be able to diagnose a concussion. We're seeing an increasing rate of TBI related ER visits. And it's the same kind of thing. You know, more people are aware that they're happening um, or possibly happening. So they're going to get checked out. Again, this is a difficult diagnosis to make. Um, looking at the etiology, the cause of the, of the condition, the location, so where someone's brain was actually hit, you know, if you were hit on the front versus the side, there, there is research showing that the results of um, the possibility of TBI changes based on whether you're hit on the top of the head versus the front versus the side. Symptoms are, are different for different people and it depends on how hard you were hit. And, you know, sometimes there's loss of consciousness, sometimes there's not. Uh, so there's, it's more difficult with the different symptoms out there. It's not really a, a one, um, one thing to diagnose it on. And then as we just discussed imaging, we don't necessarily have any imaging that can show, yes, there's a concussion. So we have to rely on a lot of other things to tell us what's going on. Over the years, there's been a lot of biomechanical criteria that's been developed to help us understand um, traumatic brain injury and, and skull fracture. So the research is all showing us that head acceleration, how the head moves and the brain moves, it's clearly related to closed head injuries. We can also, we also know that the time of acceleration is related. So what that means is the longer you, you're exposed to an acceleration or a movement of the body, the lower your tolerance is. So if you're really, you can withstand a very short impulse of a higher acceleration 
compared to maybe a lower acceleration, but a longer duration. So you're exposed to it for a longer time. Um, this kind of thing can be modeled. There's a lot of brain models, finite element models out there. A lot of people spent a lot of time researching this topic. And then we've got physics-based criteria that help us correlate with TBI. And I'll go into that. And that kind of pulls in where we do our, our thing is we understand what are the forces, what are the accelerations that the person may have experienced during the event. And then we can relate it back to these different charts and different biomechanical parameters to say, what is the probability that this person actually did withstand a TBI? So this chart here shows what I was explaining with the acceleration versus time. So duration is time. How long was your body exposed to that acceleration? So you can see the, you can withstand higher accelerations at a much shorter duration. So we're talking on the order of one, two milliseconds, so very, very quick. Um, and then as you, as you start getting into the longer durations and the higher accelerations, those become life-threatening because the body cannot withstand accelerations at high rates for long times. So looking at the types of accelerations that we deal with in TBI, um, the first one is translation or straight line motion. So that's the human head actually moving in a straight line, essentially put it on a table and, and just move it flat. Um, that has been shown to cause focal strain, which means strain or stretching in a very small place. Um, it's focal, it's focused in one place. So we see little areas of strain based on that straight line motion. The next one is rotation. So rotation around the CG or the center of gravity, that's right about where your ear is. So that's the human head actually rotating around itself. There's been a lot of research showing that um, rotation is one of the causes of brain injury. That causes something called diffuse strain. So diffuse means it takes place over a wider area. So it's the stretching and the moving of the brain material relative to each other over a larger area of the brain. And then you've got the angular combination. So that's a linear motion and a rotation. So something like a car accident, for example, where your body's moving with the car and then rotating. Um, so you take both of those types of accelerations into account to understand um, what does the human brain experience? What is your probability of injury? And then that shows us a, a more of a combination output of focal and diffuse strain. So you're seeing strain locally and throughout the brain. So now I'm going to go into a series of uh, different graphs and plots that are, were all developed um, over the last several years about how, to, how do we assess the probability of um, brain injury. So one of the original curves that a lot of people reference is the Wayne State Tolerance Curve. This was originally based on cadaver data. Um, like I said, it is difficult to get brain injury information out of cadavers. So this is actually more based on skull fracture. Um, so they were looking at at what point does a skull fracture, knowing then that the odds of having brain trauma is very high, obviously, with a skull fracture. They then extended this curve with volunteer and animal data so they could get more, you know, obviously live data to supplement. And that's clearly going to be at much lower accelerations. So what this plot shows, again, is that reduced, um, uh, reduced tolerance over time to, um, as you start having a longer duration. Um, this line up here, that 400 Gs at FMVSS 218, FMVSS stands for Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. 218 is the motorcycle helmet standard. So that's an example of using, um, <coughs> sorry, the, uh, the human data to help design vehicles, in this case, it's motorcycle helmets. So what we do is we assess what would the acceleration be for a certain event compared to one of these curves, for example. So this probability of MTBI, what we do for you is we look at, okay, what is the situation? Um, what do we expect the accelerations to have been in the specific situation? And how does it align on a curve like this? And then we would be able to provide something like a probability of MTBI. So you've got your 5% band, 50% band, 95% band. So this allows you to understand, okay, if in a certain event, how likely are you to have traumatic brain injury from that kind of acceleration over that time period? There's something that we hear a lot about called HIC. It's head injury criteria. This is a unitless number. It's really big in the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. 
Um, this is how they judge a, most of the head impact criteria, um, whether it's the full dummy or just head forms and how safe is a car from the interior. So HIC is something that's calculated over time from the acceleration measured inside the head. So usually this is done with a, with a crash test dummy. So what we do is we take, uh, going back to your high school calculus, is we take the integral, the acceleration over a time period. So we've talked about how time period is important. Uh, HIC is generally between 15 milliseconds and 36 milliseconds for, that's how long the acceleration pulse lasts. And then you, you essentially um, take the integral of that to the power of 2.5, and then that gives you a HIC number. Um, once you have the HIC number, you can relate it back to the probability of fracture. As we talked about with the Wayne State Tolerance Curve, originally HIC was designed more for fracture. HIC is more for actual uh, impact, like your head hitting something compared to an accelerative or inertial load where inertial or accelerative loading is where your head moves like from a crash test, but you don't actually hit anything with your head. So when you have, when you calculate the HIC, which is a unitless number, you then take the HIC and you, you can actually figure out your probability of fracture on this curve. So for example, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards limit to HIC for 50th percentile male, which is your average male, uh, 175 pounds, five foot, uh, five foot nine. They limit it at a thousand, which is about a 50% chance of fracture um, with a HIC of a thousand. And then the fifth female, which is a smaller occupant, about 108 pounds, four foot 11, her limit, for example, is 700. So this is something that um, it was a very early measure that came out as a way to really make sure that we're protecting people's heads. Um, since then, we've learned a lot about the accelerative loading and, and brain injuries from that. So then the following um, criteria kind of bring in that more accelerative loading. So I'm sure most of you have heard about the NFL um, being really concerned about concussions, especially lately that I believe that just hit the news again. Uh, so NFL data has been collected over time to look at translation, which is that linear motion versus rotation. So uh, originally it was thought maybe it was just the linear motion of the head, but then since then we've seen that rotation does play into it. So there's been a lot of testing about how helmets work to absorb energy and then what kind of uh, accelerations does the head actually experience uh, during a, an impact during football. So looking further <laughs> into rotational accelerations, uh, we see these curves are called Weibel probability curves. So essentially you have data that's we call it binary data. It's either no, there was not a fracture or no, there was not a uh, concussion or yes, there was a concussion. And then at what acceleration, rotational acceleration did it occur? And then this curve is essentially fit to show us what is your likelihood of concussion based on the rotational acceleration experience. So for example, if you have um, <laughs> 3,500 radians per second of rotational acceleration, you follow the curve up, you go across 10, 15% probability of concussion from that rotational acceleration. So this is yet another tool that we use um, to look at. So when we assess a brain injury, we don't do it from one aspect. We don't just pick HIC, for example. We don't just pick linear acceleration. What we do is we provide a suite of analysis analyses to show, okay, what is your probability of concussion from linear acceleration? What is it from rotational? What is it from combined? So this is one of the tools that we use um, to show you. And when I get into the case studies at the end, this will all really start to click that we'll sh I'll show you what the plots would look like in our reports. So then we've learned over time that linear and rotational acceleration uh, likely both feed into your probability of having a, a brain injury. So a curve like this allows us to take those two things into account. So here on the x-axis, that's linear acceleration. So that's in G's and then your rotational acceleration. So how fast does the brain move uh, essentially as, as it rotates? So what you can do here is then say, okay, I have 40 G's of linear acceleration, 2000 radians per second of rotation in my event. And this provides me a less than 1% probability of brain injury. 
So when you plot this out, you'd end up having, you know, we put a little star that puts at the crosshairs of these two um, different parameters. And then we can provide you, okay, it's about a 50% probability of traumatic brain injury. And that gets into the point where you're like, okay, it is possible at that point. So then understanding what we do on a daily basis to help you out is uh, first we assess the situation mechanics. So what is it that happened? Um, we look at witness statements and we take those for what they are, knowing that not everyone is the best fact witness. We can do site inspection. So um, we can go and see where the accident happened, if that's relevant, depending on what it is. Uh, very well versed on the regulations, standards, and laws um, that govern, you know, for example, motor vehicle design. What are the safety standards involved there? We rely on other information, such as police reports. Um, we can go, for example, motor vehicle accidents. There is a database of crash tests that exist that can give us sometimes dummy data that we can use. And then we have a lot of different modeling techniques that we can rely upon. Our next step then is we look at the medical records. So we pull out the, the claimed injuries. So what is it that they're saying happened? Um, we pull out the diagnoses. What is it that the doctor said happened? And then we can also review medical records for pre-existing conditions, because if someone has a pre-existing condition, that is important for how, uh, how relevant it is for the forces and motions going to, into the body for someone that maybe has had several concussions before versus someone that has not. Um, and then I just saw a good question. Are there any specific questions that can be asked at an injured person's deposition to assist in your evaluation? Absolutely. Um, anytime that we have a, a situation where we are brought in early enough before the person is deposed, we love to give you guys questions about, you know, how was, how was, for example, and I, I do a lot of motor vehicle things. I also do several other, you know, anything with blunt force trauma, things like that. Um, but essentially, like, how were you positioned? How were you postured? Where were you looking? Um, what did you think that you hit? Um, it, so it, uh, there's definitely a lot of questions that we can help provide to see, you know, things that help in our analysis. And sometimes it helps us debunk that, you know, what they're saying is not conducive with the, the situation that's there. It also helps us with modeling um, if modeling is appropriate. So, yes, absolutely. Please always ask us. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help in prep for a deposition. So once we have all this information together, um, we'll then perform an analysis. So our job is to do a correlation or a consistency analysis is what we try to say is, is are the injuries consistent with the event? Um, that's kind of our, that's the realm that we live in. Like I said before, we will not, we will not dispute a diagnosis, but we will look at it at face value and say, yes, this is possible based on what happened in the event or no, the mechanism of that kind of injury doesn't occur with the way that this person's body moved. Uh, we can differentiate between acute or traumatic conditions and chronic conditions. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with things like disc herniations in the spine. Um, that is a chronic condition. There's a lot of things that we can look at to see, okay, well, you have things like osteophytes, which is little bony protrusions that the body produces based on um, having to adjust to things not being quite right. There's arthritis, you know, signs that we can see. So a lot of times we can paint the picture, especially if we have medical records from before the accident to show, look, they already had degeneration, they already had chronic conditions. And then we would go ahead and assess what, you know, did this situation exacerbate it? for example, or, you know, did it cause it? Is it not consistent? Uh, we live a lot in the world of everyone thinks that they cause, have a disc herniation from a low speed or air impact. I can tell you generally that is not true. That's a lot of what we do is look at low speed or air impact. Oh, I tore my rotator cuff. Okay. Well, we can take a look at that. The odds are generally quite low on a situation like that. Um, so across the board, you know, we, we, we get some very interesting claims um, and very interesting situations. And I'll show you when we get into the case examples that things you wouldn't imagine people have claimed and we're able to look through them objectively and, and kind of give our, our information on that. So it's always important to give us as much information. I've, I've had a lot of cases where people are like, oh, I have you know 4,000 pages of medical records. Are you sure you want them all? Well, 
I don't want to spend time going through 4,000 pages, but you wouldn't believe the kind of information that you can see, especially things like lower back pain. You know, someone has claimed it four years ago. Well, that plays into the fact that it's a chronic condition. So um, we definitely sift through things carefully to make sure that we understand the whole picture so we can put together uh, a full analysis for you. Okay, so now we're going to get into the case studies. Um, these are interesting and they do get a little repetitive. I will apologize for that, but we wanted to be able to show you what are all the different things that people have claimed over the years. So these are all actual cases that we've looked at um, that all deal with traumatic brain injury. So as we look into each one of these, you want to keep in mind, does the version of the events make sense? Um, is what they're telling us happened actually really make sense with what happened? And then is the event consistent with the current in injury mechanism? So number two is really what we focus on as biomechanical engineers is, is could this injury have been caused or is it consistent with the event? Okay, case number, study number one, a rear end accident. So this is with a commercial driver, and I'm sure most of you know that when commercial drivers are involved, people tend to sue a little bit more. In this case, the blue sedan here was rear-ended by a van. Uh, the occupant of the blue car was claiming neck injuries and traumatic brain injury. So VAR stands for Vehicle Accident Reconstruction. Um, it was performed in this case by two different experts. So within the biomechanical group, um, we are all qualified to do general accident reconstructions. Um, my background is more actually in vehicle than biomechanics. I'm now, I'm now dual purpose. Um, but within our group here at RIMCIS, we're all qualified to do accident reconstruction, um, which allows us to first do the analysis and then um, bring in the injury part of it too. So in this case, the DV, which is called, del uh, it's called Delta V or change in velocity. So it's what, how, <coughs> sorry, how much does the car speed up or slow down uh, due to being hit. So expert number one on this case said that the, <coughs> the DV was less than four miles an hour. So definitely a low speed. Expert number two said it was about 10 miles an hour. So then we're going to follow through our traumatic brain injury analysis using those two delta Vs. So from those, there's been a lot of testing that allows us to correlate head and head acceleration to DV. There's been enough crash testing and enough um, analyses out there that there's generally some calculations we can do to say what the head accelerations were based on a rear end impact at these different delta Vs. Using the four miles an hour from expert number one, the, the head acceleration was about 10 Gs with a hick of 11. Um, just remember a hick of a thousand is the legal limit when you're designing head interior um, impact locations within a, within a car. So that hick of 11 is very, very low. Expert number two, um, using the 10 mile an hour DV, their acceleration was about 26 Gs and the hick was 124. So still the hick is, is quite low considering what the tolerance is. Then we look into the rotational accelerations. So again, uh, we have calculations that we can do based on knowing where the CG of the head is, what kind of accelerations we see laterally, we can then relate, relate that to rotational accelerations. Um, so using that four mile an hour DV, we're looking at about 740 radians per second squared. And the second expert at the 10 miles an hour, the rotational acceleration for that occupant's head would be about 2300 radians per second squared. So from there, we start to rely on these curves that are well published in literature, well accepted. So this compares peak linear acceleration um, to the probability of concussion. This was based on one of the studies that did a lot with NFL data. And then it also brought in, they instrumented, um, they had thousands and thousands of uh, data points about um, college and high school football players. They put accelerometers in, in helmets um, and then just kept recording through games season after season, collected all the data. And then anytime a concussion was, um, was found, they went back and then tagged that information so they could start to create these probability curves. So again, this is what we call the a Weibull distribution, where essentially all the points down here represent the different accelerations where someone where someone's head experiences, or in this case, it was measured in the helmet. 
versus when was a concussion actually um, diagnosed. So all these cases down here, there was no diagnosis of concussion. These cases up here, there was. Um, so then it allows you to create this, this probability curve to connect the two data sets. So the green line here represents our four mile an hour DV probability of concussion. The red line here is the 10 mile an hour. What I want you to notice is it's this black line coming down here. Where do they intersect? Almost at zero. So you draw the line where these would intersect straight across, one, two, three percent prob probability of concussion. So based on linear acceleration, we're looking at an extraordinarily low probability of concussion from that rear end, rear end impact. And in our case, we don't like to stop at just one analysis. We want to make sure that we provide multiple data points to show you that this this event is not consistent with a concussion. So then we move on to rotational accelerations. Again, we calculated those for the four mile an hour DV and the 10 mile an hour DV. The green line is the four, the red line is the 10. As you can see, the green one is essentially off the charts, so about zero. The red one is right at the beginning, one, two, three percent. Again, a very, very low probability of concussion. And then to round it out, we always want to see, OK, well, let's let's find another paper, you know, another uh, bank of research. You know, so this is the one that combines the linear and rotational accelerations and set, it shows us how do these two work together um, to, to give us any probability of concussion. So again, four mile an hour, 10 mile an hour, they are both well below the one percent probability of uh, of concussion here. So this is one of those situations where we would say concussions or TBI is not consistent with this accident. So now that I've kind of oriented you to how this works, you know, what kind of plots we do, what kind of analysis we do, now we've got some more case studies to show you some of the more fascinating um, claims that people have made over the years. So we had one that came in where someone was hit by a lift gate. Uh, airport security officer was inspecting a minivan with a power lift gate. Reportedly, the lift gate closed and hit the head of the security officer. Claim was TBI. Uh, when looking at the medical records, the CT of the cervical, cervical spine was unremarkable with no acute injury. CT of the brain showed no intracranial or extraaxial abnormalities, so very normal. The MRI of the cervical spine showed multiple disc protrusions or herniations, annular, annular bulges with facet arthropathy. So to break that down, disc protrusions or herniations, we know about that. So um, there's very specific mechanisms that, um, that cause disc herniations, and this is unlikely to be one of them. Uh, facet arthropathy, that's arthritis. And as most people know, arthritis, arthritis is something that's caused over time. But the final diagnosis here was a closed head injury without loss of consciousness. So from what we see here, no intracranial or extra axial abnormalities doesn't sound like a closed head injury, but we have to go with a diagnosis here. That's what the doctor provided. So we will move forward with that. Um, and again, concussions are hard to diagnose with imaging as well. So it was obviously symptom based that the person described to the doctor. We love doing demonstrations when they are appropriate. So in this case, the engineer on this case was Michael. Um, he's got a bite block in his mouth um, that measures acceleration. So he graciously volunteered himself to be pummeled over the head by this lift gate. Um, he did it several times, in fact, and measured the data uh, to make sure that he wasn't missing anything. Doesn't look that bad to me, but we'll let the data speak for itself on this one. So he was able to measure um, the, the, for, the closing force on this. So it ranged from 15 to 31 pounds. When he actually had the bite block in and, and measured the head accelerations on himself, he was seeing his maximum head impact was less than 1.25 Gs. And for reference, uh, gravity is one G. So essentially what we do with this information is then is we can relate this to activities of daily living. Um, that you can represent of how much uh, acceleration someone's head goes through if they sit in a chair, if they were to jump off an eight inch step, things like that to give you a nice understanding of, okay, this situation is no more dangerous or no more likely to cause a concussion than anything else you do during the day. 
Okay, the next case study is looking at a semi-trailer collision. In this case, uh, there was a person in a stopped tractor trailer and it was rear-ended by another one at seven miles an hour. The driver of the struck tractor reportedly was standing by the sleeper at the time. So he claimed he was standing here in front of his bed. He claimed that when he was rear-ended, that he was propelled forward, which resulted in brain injuries. This was a great opportunity to bring in something called MADIMO. MADIMO is mathematical dynamic modeling. Um, this, this is a really, really powerful tool that allows us to put an occupant into a car, in this case, into a sleeper berth, and run a physics-based simulation, understand how would the body move relative to the forces of this event, and then the, um, the occupant in there is actually has instrumentation within it so we can get out forces, moments, accelerations to then relate those back to injury criteria. So in this case, he said, I was propelled forward and hit my head. Well, when you're rear-ended, it's very clear to see here, you're going to move backwards. So he would have been moving backwards into his bunk. It's not consistent with what he said was happening. So in this case, we, we measured a HIC of 10. And again, going back to HIC value of 1,000 is our limit here. And HIC value of 1,000 corresponds to an 18% chance of probability of a severe head injury. So we're very, very, very low. And when you actually bring the accelerations into those other charts we were looking at, the risk of mild TBI is 0.03%. So extremely, extremely low. Next one is a parking lot. So in this situation, a hotel guest was walking through a parking lot. He claimed that his head was hit repeatedly by this closing beam or this gate here. He had no visible injury, but he was diagnosed with a concussion. So we had um, a volunteer here. I believe he was a gate worker there. He volunteered to let himself be hit. So one of our questions is repeatedly. How was this person repeatedly hit by something that moved this slowly? So that's one thing where we look at, okay, is the person's um, explanation of what happened, is it realistic? Is it consistent? Does it make sense? So being hit repeatedly on the head by this gate does not make sense. Um, you'd have to move really, really slowly. And obviously we're showing here that the fact that this occupant or this person has very little issue with getting hit by the gate, but the odds of a TBI are extremely low on this one as well. Here's one with a falling cooler. So a convenience store customer claimed that a cooler fell from the top of the shelf and hit her on the head. Uh, the cooler in question was a half gallon cooler. It was empty at the time. It weighed less than a pound. So again, Michael is subjecting himself to abuse. He's got the subject cooler here, setting up in, the, in a situation to uh, mimic what was in the grocery store based on the um, the facts of the event that were provided. Okay. He's got the bite block in there to measure acceleration, allows himself to get hit on the head. Michael is, is a champ here for taking this abuse for us. Okay. Okay. So we can see that he was struck on the forehead. So obviously what he's trying to do here is replicate the same situation that the person had explained. His testing results here, this is again the Wayne State Tolerance Curve. You see this bottom dash line here is a probability of TBI of 5%. The red line represents what he experienced during this, so a negligible uh, probability of concussion based on this curve. Uh, just like the other ones that we've done, we also can compare the linear and rotational acceleration way below our 1% band. So again, negligible probability of concussion here. Okay, um, I know there's a lot of case studies, but it is worth it to just see the kinds of claims that we've had and the types of ways that we can address them. So in this case, a food processing worker was hit on the hard hat by a partially filled rack. The incident report indicated that a forklift operator caused a chain reaction of events at the gantry. The rack weighed at least 100 pounds and the claim here was TBI. So in this case, um, a site inspection was actually uh, done to monitor the workers operating the machinery so we can understand what was happening, how do people do their job, what moves, what doesn't. And it allowed us to recreate the accident scenario to see that there were inconsistencies in the story that was provided. 
So the red here provides the initial position of where the rack was. The blue, the darker blue here is <laughs> the final location. And then the light blue here represents the different um, ways that the, to represent the moving, um, the movement of that rack. So the fully loaded rack had to travel more than eight feet to hit the rack on the other end, which is not consistent. But assuming the worst case, um, the analysis was conducted to look at a free falling rack that generated a point load on the head. The head and the upper body uh, peak acceleration was about three and a half to four Gs with a peak rotational acceleration less than 500 radians per second. So again, we go back to our charts here. Um, we, you know, we can do things like provide the diagrams to show you what's happening, the different dimensions that were measured at the inspection. You see our little red star here, way below the 1% probability. So again, a claim that is not consistent with the event that occurred. Uh, so this one, we see the conclusion for this case is that it was less than 5 Gs for acceleration, where again, 1 G is related to gravity. Um, and the level of acceleration was slightly beyond what we see in uh, routine motions of the body and things like that, but it's still well below head accelerations associated with causing TBI. So we do like to bring back uh, to uh, activities of daily living. So there's a lot of research about, like I mentioned before, what kind of accelerations or forces does the body experience when sitting down in a chair, uh, when running, when sneezing in some cases. So we can relate these accelerations back to those to show what happened here is no worse than what you can do in a daily, in, in your daily routine. So here's one where an adult male stated he was walking on the sidewalk and a 10 pound piece of concrete fell from the top of the hotel building. He claimed a loss of consciousness, LOC, and neck injury, but he had no visible signs of injury. So in analyzing the free fall of that rock, uh, 10 pound rock, it would have hit his head at 35 miles an hour based on that height. The dynamic force then uh, of that rock hitting his head would have been between 1,400 and 7,000 newtons. Going back to our fracture tolerances, uh, so we, you know, we go back to literature whenever possible to back up our research and, and our, uh, our analyses. You see fracture of the frontal bone occurs at 1,000 to 6,500 newtons. So we are definitely in the range that skull fracture occurs. So for him to say that there was actually, that to show that he has no visible sign of injury is definitely not consistent. If he was hit with a rock from that height, we're getting into the point where skull fracture occurs. So clearly his story is not consistent with what actually happened. And then I believe this is our final case study. Um, this is a falling hat. So someone threw a hard hat off of a ship and struck a worker on the head. The hat weighed, the hard hat was just under a pound, fell about 35 feet. So this gave us a good opportunity to do some more testing. This was a setup. Um, so these rigs here are to hold the, the hard hat in place. And then uh, this head form here has accelerometers in it. Uh, we've got a hard hat here so we can measure the resulting acceleration that the person's head would have experienced. That's the video. So the hard hat up here is released from the 35 feet. And it lands on the helmet so they can measure the acceleration. So in this case, that hard hat would have reached a peak velocity of about 32 miles per hour with a peak acceleration of over 100 Gs. The peak contact force to the hard, to the hard hat itself was about 141 pounds. This is actually a situation where there was a 20% risk of resulting in, in a TBI. This is a case where we would say, yes, at this point, this situation is consistent with a TBI. So the main things to take away here is that not all head impacts result in concussions. Um, uh, minor traumatic brain injury and concussions are difficult to rule out based on medical imaging or clinical diagnosis alone. As we mentioned, you can't really see it on the imaging and you're relying on someone describing their symptoms. But from the biomechanical side, what we can do for you is look at how the incident and the injuries occurred. And then we can also assist you in understanding the event's physics, you know, are, and then figure out is is the injury consistent with what happened? We've got a lot of tools that we can provide with you. So we can go with the analysis, um, with, with the graphs there, compare it to activities of daily living. If needed, we're more than happy to do modeling such as Matimo or physical testing. Um, so with that, that uh, that's all I have for you on traumatic brain injury. So 
by all means, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Looks like we're not getting any questions, but uh, are people able to follow up with you if uh, they want to have some more questions they want to ask you? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm hoping everyone has my email from the initial slide, or if, if I'm more than happy for that to be shared along with my phone number. But so I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about, you know, your situation at hand and how we can be helpful. So the questions from this, the slides um, accessible. So um, from our end, my understanding is that we're not allowed to share the slides and we're gonna look into seeing if the video is, is um, able to be shared. We'll, we'll check onto that on our side. Thank you. All right, if there are no further questions, I think we'll wrap this up. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate your time.